Hello, Adventures Through the Mind listeners. This is your host, James Jessel, here with a special bonus episode releasing just in time for Halloween. And uh, we're going to be exploring a little bit about horror films today. Our guest is May Litz. Oh, is yep. that right? May yep, Litz, right. Um, who is a filmmaker, video artist, and writer out of Fort Worth, Texas. She has a bachelor's in art and art history from UT Arlington with a focus on film video. She is mostly known for her YouTube channel, Nick's Fears, which is mostly dedicated to an underlying appreciation of horror films. May, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. So what makes horror films so enticing? Oh, wow. Um, okay, right out the gate. The, um, I think that horror films are enticing for uh, the reason that they safely allow us to enter into a surrogation situation where we can confront things that are dangerous, scary, or threatening. Uh, like we're, like we're, we're openly entering into a scenario where we can experience the threat without actually having to experience it. And often because of that, it allows us to, uh, just recontextualize our life around that idea. Like the things that happen to other people on screen, we empathetically connect with, and then we can apply it to ourselves. Or at least I think that that's a lot of it. Like, Yeah. I, that's that's sort of my general sense on why why we like that but i don't know i mean i think there are specific reasons for different specific genres and things like that like uh and a lot of that comes down to like deep seated sort of personal fears like i think that body horror just as a genre is really kind of it's it's a way that that people that are like her like horrified by their own body and other people's bodies and just like the human experience like can confront that so it's kind of a cathartic experience i guess is what i mean uh it can be a cathartic experience as much as it can be kind of like a preparation experience uh so i don't know that's that's sort of my hot take on on it hmm. Yeah. So wh what is what is body horror and what are some of the different sort of uh, larger subgenres of, of horror and what would you say are the are the leading inclinations for people um, under the underneath each of those uh, subgenres? Maybe just a few. Okay. Of them. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Well, OK, so like body horror, like, uh, well, the, the clear example is like David Cronenberg movies, which is like uh, video drum, the fly, uh, stuff like that, where, where people are exposed to some sort of thing and it drastically changes their, their physicality and their physiology. And then they're awake and alert as their physiology changes, uh, into this kind of horrific thing. So, you know, because we're all scared of getting sick or something bad happened to us or, um, uh, just not feeling it quite at home in our own skin when, when he makes these movies like this and we watch these movies, uh, we kind of have the ability to confront that, uh, in sort of an absurdist kind of abstract way. Uh, but other subgenres, well, there's like slashers, which I have a very diverse history, but I think that that slasher movies often have like this sort of sociopolitical bent where it's talking about the society in which the slasher is allowed to happen. Um, and then you've got something like, uh, oh, I don't know, like like a cannibal horror movie. <laughs> like usually those are um, bad, but um, usually those are like uh, exploiting people's fears of like foreigners, and they're usually like really bad. But but um, th I mean that that doesn't change the fact that that's why that was made. Like that's why these things exist. Um, but, you know, I don't know. There's there's like a lot of it. I, I'm a big fan of religious horror, too, because I kind of came from a somewhat, well, Catholic Orthodox family. So, like, I understand the bent of, like, watching uh, something like Catholicism get exploited into this, like, horrible thing with evil demons and whatnot and screaming nuns and everything's on fire, you know. Uh, there's some sort of... Um, odd satisfaction in in the in disorder lurking within the the like 
the press of order or something like that. I don't know. Um, but every subgenre kind of has this sort of thing where the appeal and the reason that these keep getting around and why people keep going and seeing them, uh, it just has a lot to do with like our own personal needs, like what we need to see, which is, I think a lot different than other genres of film. Like, I don't think a lot of people like need comedy in the same way, like comedy kind of like, you know, you, you feel like you get a laugh and a laugh is good, but, but horror is this like diverse, weird genre (laughs) that provides different nuanced kinds of micro emotions and things that like things that you're dealing with directly and they're on screen right there. You know, it's, it's very personal. Um, so I think every like subgenre of that has that sort of bent to a certain kind of person, but yep. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. That's interesting. I I definitely see the relationship between uh, horror and comedy. I can't remember. Maybe it was you actually about, about, uh, horror and, genre films and and horror and comedy having this relationship with, oh i think it was um no it was um jordan peele had mentioned this oh, yeah, horror yeah, and yeah. comedy are very closely related because horror has a specific target it's very specific make you scared make you grossed out whatever comedy is the same it's a very specific goal it's just make that person laugh for example right um and it's it's funny it's almost like horror and comedy are are um are like two sides of a spectrum You're making someone feel absolutely disgusted and frightened compared to making somebody feel elated and 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 laughing and i could really connect with what you're saying there about being called to um religious horror i grew up in a fairly strict religious home and my father was jehovah's witness and so the language around why certain things were not allowed was something akin to it's demonic it's demons in the world so i heard demons and demonic a lot of times throughout the course of my life and and i had a natural you know interest inclination towards these types of things and as i got older anything that had to do with demonic possession that had really obvious demon imagery or occult imagery or uh, religious imagery, especially stuff that's like very satanic. That stuff just really excited me because it worked on multiple levels. One, it gave me a place where I could explore the things that I was told at a very young age were like the ultimate horror, like, you know, the quote, the real horrors, you know, like the devil yeah. and and whatever. But it also gave me an opportunity to... Um, so, so to like process that stuff and get confront that stuff and also... To basically be like, yo, F you, I'll watch whatever I want. Don't tell me what to do. So it was a really also a uh, great place for me to be rebellious against a, a very um, limiting and uh, oppressive uh, ideology that was that was given to me. Uh, you know, not not you know not maliciously, but as a consequence of, right. of the world that I grew up in, the the family I grew up in. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Totally connect with that. <laughs> mm-hmm. So one of the things that I'm curious about, there's a underlying desire for people. I mean, possibly it's just to get excited, like just to have that thrill of of being on the edge of your seat in some way or another. But if there's underlying psychological desire to face and process, make sense, purge, whatever, um, things inside of us, and, and that's why we reach out to certain forms of horror, and that horror evolves, like the content of horror evolves with the times to sort of accurately reflect what needs to be processed. Um, I'm curious about the rise of uh, torture porn and oh, things like new French yeah. extremism. What are your thoughts on what that's, what's calling out in that? What parts of, of these movies are we relating to? Well, okay. So that's that's kind of a tough one because number one is that torture porn is that that label when somebody says that's a torture porn film is something that was put on by like critics onto Mm. things to categorize them when really they're a very diverse sort of thing they actually exist like as extreme versions of other subgenres like for instance uh i i think that hostile is a is is basically a cannibal movie like it's it's about how scary foreigners are Mm. uh but it's just really extreme 
Uh, and then, you know, you've got something like Saw, which I think is kind of like a slasher, but also kind of like body horror, where it's just like having to make decisions that involve your body on to survive. Like, you know, there's stuff like that. But then like new French extreme stuff is very sociopolitical. Like all of that stuff is is all related to. I mean, there's a reason that it's called, you know, new French extreme you know, stuff. It, it was in that region and it was all coming out at the same time. And that's sort of the, the like, oh, this is like a whole thing uh, that, that changes everything um, and makes it kind of its own sort of genre. So I, f- I feel competent pairing all of the new French extreme movies together in, in their own sort of way. But like when you get to the Western side, like a lot of the stuff that we saw over here in comparison to the stuff that you're seeing in like Japan, like Takashi Miike movies Mm -hmm. versus like, you know, France, uh, Pascal Laguerre, I believe is the director's name of, of martyrs. Uh, you've got those sorts of things happening all over the world for different kind of sociopolitical reasons where in the West it was, it was more kind of just taking the extreme aspects of those and then just applying them to genres that already existed. Um, yeah, I mean, I wonder about that, too, because they're, the nugget of the thing, the reason that the thing that we're all connecting with when I say we, <laughs> the thing that people are connecting with is the extreme aspect of it. It's the fact that, you know, you're it's not just you're going to see some people die. It's going you're going to see people die gruesomely, like in horrible ways, uh, which is a strange thing to experience like in a theater. And I, maybe it has something to do with like the things that immediately came before it. Like maybe people felt like the early two thousands, uh, horror movies, you know, I, I know what you did last summer, uh, scream this sort of ironic kind of thing that was going on. Maybe it has something to do with the, the irony where people got tired of the irony and they wanted to feel a legitimate experience. And so they were attracted to like extreme violence, which kind of was very authentic and genuine. And it, it kind of did away with the irony. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I can't, I can't say for sure that that's exactly what happened, but I mean, one could easily make that argument. I mean, I think that the weird thing too, is that these Japanese movies and these French movies and all this stuff, it all flooded over, um, which is not something that typically happens with foreign film. Like foreign film does not get to Western audiences quite as much as like, you know, even indies in this country get seen more than foreign film, Mm -hmm. but not these movies. Everybody knows about these movies, you know? So what happened there? You know, these movies got around uh, which is wild to think about. And so I don't know. I, I think that there's two sides of the of the argument here where where one is it like, why did everybody connect with this? And also, why was this happening at all? And uh, I I don't know if I can really speak to why it was happening because I'm not French. I'm not Japanese. I don't know exactly what the sociopolitical uh, angle there was for them. but. I knew that it had a lot to do with um, uh, their their feelings towards their like government and uh, authoritarianism and things like that. Um, and it was it, it was kind of an act of rebellion. Uh, whereas on our side, connecting with it, I think that I think that connecting with it is a really difficult thing because. I feel like the base level answer to why we connect with it is because it is extremely unflattering about the human experience. It's like, um, it's like, well, it's torturous for the audience as much as it's torturous for the people on screen. You know, um, everybody thinks they're going to get some kind of joy out of watching it, but really they don't. It's sad and miserable and horrific. Uh, but then some people do get a get a weird joy out of it. I've I've never felt that. So I don't like I don't get why people 
love it in like a excited fun way because it's always a miserable experience for me but um i've seen all the movies i've seen like every every one of those like this is the most messed up movie movies and every time i'm like cool exciting we're gonna watch something that's gonna scar me for life and then you sit down and you watch it and it just makes you real sad and you can't sleep for a week you know because you're thinking about that poor woman getting her skin flayed you know which totally happens in a movie you know right, and you're like right. yeah 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 yeah. i um, you know it's interesting because um you know, I am one of those people who used to take a lot of joy from watching extreme gore and uh, not so much anymore, although it is sort of like, um, you know, I don't I don't often like to get drunk, but when I like when I get drunk, I, I like I like to get drunk. Right. So the same right. thing. It's like I don't really often watch really intense, gory horror anymore anymore. But when I do. I, I like to go there. And yeah. I know that part of that was uh, an evolution for me um, of my interest as I got older. And I was right on the, I guess I was right inside of that wave into extremism. Um, and then at some point in my early 20s, um, my, uh, uh, my fascination with horror and death metal became, <laughs> um, became something that I could structure my sort of first flush of adulthood around socially because I worked at a I worked at a record store that featured like spe specifically tried to get the weirdest things like everywhere else yeah. you go they wouldn't even know this but we have it in stock kind of thing mm -hmm. and I began to become the guy building the metal and the uh, and the horror sections and what happened there is I ended up getting increasingly more um identified with myself as a gore hound and i started showing these films in public which I, I i'm not supposed to do and in hindsight when i look at the level of detail and commitment and work that goes into organizing an actual film festival i feel like a little remorseful for being such a whatever man we'll just show it at a bar um but <laughs> but at, at that time i ended up going into watching these films um and i'd watch two or three a week because i had to have two a week to show so I ended up watching all these films and I identified myself as being a gore hound and it would get really excited when watching things like, uh, you know, watching things like Hostel or any Eli Roth movie are, you know, pretty intense and getting that like, oh my God, holy shit, they did it. Uh, you know, like really excitable. Yeah. Um, and then continuing onwards, I got to a point where I, now this is in hindsight, but I, I realized that my extreme fascination with gore was a compensation for deep insecurity because it, it helped me feel powerful knowing that I could watch these things. And having looked in a little bit into the psychology, possibly it was because I was identifying with the aggressor. Not that I would actually do these things, yeah. but it gave me an opportunity to feel powerful in this extreme theatrics where I felt very right. insecure the rest of my in, in a lot of the rest of my life. And then in social situations, I would be able to start gearing the conversation towards some of the fucked up stuff that I'd seen, which would make other people uncomfortable, which is not, I mean, this isn't healthy. I'm in my early 20s. I was making a lot right. of bad social choices, you know? Um, right. But that is the way that I could I could do that until I pushed. I pushed all the way into Mondo films and watching things like Traces of Death, which is different than yeah. Faces of Death. And at a certain point after a few days, because I could only do 15, 20 minutes and I had to stop. After about three days of that, it occurred to me that I was just looking around and everyone I saw, I just could like, everything was gray and I was just picturing people dying violent deaths and all the different scenarios I was in. And it occurred to me I had crossed a line and I don't yeah. know where that line was, but I was definitely... I had definitely crossed it and I've been stepping it back further and further over time um, to the yeah. point where now I can take some joy in it periodically. Um, but for the most part, I, you know, you know, what goes in what is what comes out and I take psychedelics and I don't really want to be going through watching, you know, being involved in some sort of gruesome something or other that's hanging around in my subconscious because I chose to watch an <laughs> Eli Roth film for recreation. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think that there's something to be said about like your experience and like our, our differentiation between like fantasy and reality in film too, because like, I don't know, I feel like some, some of these kinds of movies have the safe ability to be completely fantasy and it's not something that, um, 
you can watch it and it can it can just kind of fall right off of you. Mm -hmm. Uh, It doesn't linger on you. I I think that 70s like gore movies are pretty great for that because it all looks pretty bad, but you still get the general idea. Uh, So you still get what you want, but then it just kind of falls right off of you. Um, but the, I, I've seen some of those Mondo movies. Um, I've seen quite a few of them. Uh, Goodbye Uncle Tom, uh, Africa Dio, where a dude literally gets hung for real. And you're like, okay, you know, um, those don't have that ability. Those are kind of weirdly, purely real. And they, they will linger in there. Uh, they, they don't go away. Uh, quite as easily and I think that was around the time when I stopped too because I I mean we have very similar experience in this in this place because you know part part of it for me I think was the fascination with finding the thing that was lost you know Hmm. nobody talks about these movies what are these movies uh I want to find the the new weird one that nobody's talking about you know, how, how deep does this rabbit hole go? And then once you find out how deep the rabbit hole goes, you go, Oh God, you know, now I'm watching a movie called slaughtered vomit dolls. <laughs> and you're like, Oh no, uh, something has gone horribly wrong somewhere, you know, and it's just not worth it. Mm. Um, and at some point you do kind of have to like beat that out of yourself. Um, and, and I think that a lot of it comes from, yeah, like social development and like, you know, the 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 fear of of like being powerless in your social environment and and things like that and like yeah identifying with the aggressor i think that these movies encourage that in a weird way i i I, maybe even if they don't even intend to they just kind of inadvertently encourage you to empathize with the aggressor because the, everybody in the movie is just disposable. Mm-hmm. You know, they're all going to die. Why connect with them? Connect with the person that's going to survive, you know, uh, the person who's going to, who's going to do it to them or whatever. The one person with power in the entire movie, you know, something like that. Mm. But like, yeah, no, I mean, my point is like my experience and your experience are very similar. So I totally get that. I uh, I I feel like the comparison here to internet pornography is is a really good one because I see this pattern. It's like okay, you see something, you kind of like it, and then you progress over time to increasingly more extreme. Because especially if the thing that you liked about it um, excited you, you know, like you yeah. start you start with rock climbing, and you know, fast forward ten years, and you're a base jumper kind of thing. Right. Um, yeah. And. The same thing could be said for me. It was like I was, you know, I started with, uh, you know, things like Freddy Krueger, which is a one of my absolute favorite franchises. But we can maybe talk more about franchises later. Um, it started with things like Freddy Krueger, and then ended up eventually into things like Hostel, and that's what ended up being like. All right, so what's the most intense thing I can find? And at the time, finding things like Cannibal Holocaust, I Spit on Your Grave, and these types of things. Um, and it, it just grows. And at some point you need something really extreme to get your rocks off. And I, and I think about the, the, it's, I wouldn't say it's a meme, but it's sort of like a, you know, people just say it as a joke. It's like you log in on the internet you just want to look at some boobs. And the next thing you know, you know, it's 45 minutes to an hour has gone by and you're watching like anal midget clown porn, you know, um, with, with, blood you know it's like and like how did i even i don't even i didn't know i could be aroused by this you know it's so it's like yeah i can see how that it's easy to get lost in that in that cycle of um of thrill seeking and as a consequence end up sort of damaging your brain because excessive internet pornography damages your arousal system insofar as how you relate to what arouses you in you know unless unless you're actually having you know anal sex with midget clowns on the regular you know it's like (laughs) You know, that's 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 going to make it difficult for you to show up to a real person that's a you know a normal average person that's just relating sexually. Right. And the same could be said about how we experience um, how we experience ourselves if, when right. it comes to yeah. uh, and, and what we get pleasure out of. Yeah, and and I think uh, part of that is well, like it's funny how media like affects us psychologically and stuff like that because i I mean i I don't know i think about this a lot and you know like the porn uh comparison is very apt but like 
I I feel like when I look back at my like watching all these movies, like these really fucked up movies, like it did damage my ability to relate to people too. You know, it was like you see human beings differently. You start to see them as ants, you know, you start to see them as people that are just going to die horribly. Why connect with anybody? You know, you just end up not having relationships with people. And I think porn, the things that you're saying about porn actually kind of have the same way where it it makes these people like disposable. It makes, you know, sexuality and, and romanticism completely disposable. And it just kind of, they, it lives in this like little brief window and then they're gone and you never see them again. And it's like, they they only live in the context of this act. And then you start to see people also living in these two contexts where it's either sex or death. And those are the two ways that humans can exist. And then, you know, that's that's just all you can see. I don't know. Yeah. You know, I, mean, I, I think at this point it, it's, it's important for us to, you know, clarify that we're talking about problem watching. Like problem use of horror films, um, for, right? For the average absolutely. person, they're not going to go back and keep watching brutal horror, you know, f- four times not. a week, <laughs> you know, and then yeah. rewatching it with groups of people. Um, and and same for pornography. It's like there could be a lot of fun to be had watching some pornography from time to time, you know, um, even if it's kind of intense stuff. Every now and then, it's like, yeah, I'm kind of curious what that looks like. Um, right. And then same for horror. You know, same for same, but right. the pr- problematic usage gets problematic, and and I think that we get there because there's something already going on that's not that's not right in ourselves, something unhealthy there, right. and we find some sort of solace in in that behavior, um, in that the that that media that we'll call the behavior that particular consumption of that particular style of media, and then it grows to an extreme over time, only worsening yeah. the very thing that we sought. To, so I, it's an addiction. It's a classical example of addiction. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, uh, it's McLuhan's too, because it's like McLuhan's got that thing about how uh, we invent technology, but we have no idea what it's actually going to be used for. You know, when they invented the smartphone, they didn't know that everybody was just going to be watching porn all day on it, you know? Um, <laughs> and when they invented porn, they didn't think that people were going to obsess over porn and then it was just going to be their entire life. And it's just when when people make extreme horror films, they didn't think that, you know, years later, people would be obsessively watching them too, you know, and how that was going to end up affecting them. So it was like, it's not really anything to sh- to slight the actual... Uh, films and the filmmakers and the people that actually just kind of casually enjoy watching this stuff. It's just like, it, it has this weird kind of property to it like that, or it can just be, um, it can be exploited by the the human experience Mm -hmm. if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess it's, I mean, not to, not to overly generalize here, but there's a lot of different behaviors that can quickly spiral out into addiction from, you know, yeah. media consumption is one of them, shopping, uh, sex, like real sex with an actual person, you know, all sorts of yeah. things can, oh, and of course, substances, including coffee or whatever's in your cup there, you know, it's possible. Yeah. So oh, I'm addicted to coffee as hell. I, I drink it all day. So <laughs> I actually, yeah. I didn't have coffee for a week. I was using, uh, I was drinking a chaga mushroom tea for dark something and then taking a oh, stack with uh, L-theanine and uh, caffeine as my caffeine source. And then oh, this yeah. morning I was like, you know, I think I'll have a coffee and I smelt the bag and my whole being, I was just like, oh, my God, I love coffee so much. <laughs> yeah, I know. Why is it so magical? I hate it. Uh, okay, so let's let's shift a little bit. Um, yeah. You know, Marshall McLuhan said, you know, the medium is the message. And obviously, that's not entirely true because the message is also – the content is obviously important. Um, right. But, but looking at the content of horror and being frightened, let's take the medium from film to – Real life, and it's still theatrical. Um, but what about things? What are your thoughts on haunted houses? You know, it's it's all it's all the rage. You know, at Halloween, people go into haunted houses, or where I live, it's not too far from Niagara Falls. You could go into a scare house at any given time. Um, what are your thoughts on 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 those things? Wow. Okay. Well, this is super apt because I'm actually making a documentary about these. Like I'm making a documentary film about this. We've been shooting for like a month now 
and we've got like two more weeks left until we're finished. So, um, yeah, uh, that's what I've been working on this month. So I, I have thoughts. Uh, yeah. So like I live in Texas and I live in the DFW area, which is kind of a, a weird kind of haunted house capital of the world where mm. a lot of the ones around here have like worldwide notoriety. So I've worked at all of them and I've been to all of them several times and I just, I've participated in the haunted house. I mean, I've got tickets on my desk, you know, like, uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I've participated in, in this, uh, whole socialization aspect of that too, like being on that side of it. And I've been on both sides of it, you know, uh, completely every year. So I, I have a pretty general knowledge of it, but I think if, if I was to take all of this research and all of this crap that I've, that I've developed over this last month and just kind of crammed it into like a sentence, I think that it's very similar to horror in the sense that or like horror film where we uh, engage with horror film to kind of cathartically and safely experience like the extreme bad, you know, mm-hmm. the, the things that can happen to you, you know, nobody wants to be murdered by a serial killer, but we pay somebody to pretend to be a serial killer to chase us around, you know? Um, I think that we engage with that for two reasons. Like one, because it's fun, which is the correct answer. Uh, that's why we should be doing this. And then the other reason is, um, you know, for the thrill of what that must feel like, uh, or something like that, you know, uh, what kind of thrill we get out of that. And it's weird to me because looking at the medium and actually going through all of these places, you start to notice all these similarities and like the best ones are these ones that are fantastical and you go in them and they're just this wild new world. And it's like this total shift of perspective and you go in there and you're like, wow, I'm in a totally different world. And wow, it's so cool. But then you've got the other ones, which are like the gritty real ones. Uh, and you know, I'm in Texas, so Texas chainsaw massacre is just everywhere. So you go into these places and it's all, you know, hillbilly murder hillbillies with, you know, axes and chainsaws and, uh, and they just chase you around and try to hurt you, you know, and, and, and then there's like, you know, extreme stuff too, which I've never, I've I've been to one extreme haunted house and it was a big mistake, (laughs) but, um, but like, you know, the, the, the ones where you're going in and there, there are people that are like using tools and using their, their actual kind of real identities to attack you and like exploit that sort of fear you have of just generally other people. Uh, that's where it starts to feel really rough and exploitational and kind of bad. Um, and I don't know exactly who gets something out of that. If that makes sense. I mean, I think, rationally if i'm thinking about it i would say that it's probably people um you know wanting to safely experience that so that if they ever end up experiencing that then you know sensory recall they know what to do or something like that it's like practice Uh, but i mean i don't i don't i think people go there because it's fun but it's so not fun sometimes and so that's kind of a, yeah, it's, it's, it's like a whole weird bottomless pit of, um, of stuff. So, yeah. 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 I, for myself, um, I've only been to a couple, um, and there's definitely a range of different ways that can scare you. And one of which is just disorienting you generally. Yeah. Another, which is, um, trying to just jump out and scare you, um, which, you know, I, I personally, I both like and dislike at the same time. It's like the absolute worst and obviously the most effective if they do it well. Uh, yeah. The other one is, is and this is what I really appreciate, is theatrics. And you yes. go in and it's it's less about confusing you and frightening you with things jumping out, you know, mechanical stuff that just goes boom. 
and more about creating a scene with other like real human people who are doing stuff right. that enters you into another dimension that's just really weird. And then I wonder yeah. about people in the sense like, okay, so you just worked that night and you did really well. Like how many hours were you sitting there screaming like, no, help me, help me in a cage? It's like, how? Do, I yeah. wonder how you decompress from that. But then there yeah, is really. like, you said this extreme – this extreme end of things. And I'm thinking specifically of haunts like Blackout and the, you know, the very infamous McCammy Manor, which has no safe words. And it's basically just hours of being tortured to the point where you just dissociate going into states where, I mean, otherwise you would never want to go to. It's physiologically and psychologically harmful to a person to yeah. even enter into those states. Um, and yet, there's, you know, whatever, 27,000 people on the waiting list to go there. Yeah. Yeah. And like, so I never did anything like that. Um, but I think, I, I mean, I have, you know, I have, I have my own thoughts about that or whatever, but like, I think that, okay. So my experience with one, uh, like that was kind of, so there's, they started to do the things where it's like touch night where you sign a waiver and then people can touch you. And it's like, okay, well, I don't really want people to touch me. That's like weird, you know, but then you do it and you're like, Oh, that was kind of something, you know, extra it's, frightening. It's a, right. It's <laughs> yeah. just like, it's just like breaking that one level of safety and you're like, Ooh, ah, a little more adrenaline this time, you know, something like that. You know, it's like, it's like an addiction or something. Um, but then, uh, there was, there was this one place that was like, they do hit nights and you're like, what is that? So the, you sign a waiver and they take you in a little room and they're like, just so you know, the people in here have been told to do whatever the fuck they want to you, which includes hurting you and picking you up and taking you places and separating you and doing whatever you want or whatever they want. So just like, know that when you sign that waiver, you, you know, you're fucked now. And they just put you in this dark room and that is what happens. Like a guy came and picked me up and just took me away and hit me in the face. You know, like, uh, it was just awful. It was just this terrible, terrible thing. Um, and you know, it's like, did, kind did you of have like, a safe word? No, no safe word. No safe word. It was too loud. Um, even if I had one. So wow. basically I was just screaming, you know, get off me, get off me. Oh my God, get off me. And then when I finally got out, like I was just like completely disheveled. It was like so horrible. Um, and I had no idea that it was going to be like that. I had no idea. Um, and that place is, I'm not going to name it by name because I don't want anybody to go there, <laughs> but, um, it's like, it's like a 45 minute drive. So I like, like I had a necklace and it was broken I had a watch. It was broken. Um, I lost a shoe, you know, like everything that could have possibly went wrong, went wrong. And I had to drive like 45 minutes home, hmm. you know, from this place. And, and you just kind of like disassociate from your body. You know, you're like thinking back on this experience and it's like really difficult to actually think back on it. So it like it transcends this haunted house experience. It's almost like a totally different experience because it is not a safe experience. It's like literally paying people to hurt you. And when you do that, then like, is that preparation for something that, or is that just the thing? You know what I mean? Like, right. is it, are you, um, are you still entering into a safe environment when you know you won't be killed, but you're going to feel like you're going to be killed. And like that, are you trying to find that feeling in yourself? You know, I don't know exactly, but I feel like I needed to experience that, um, for, for nuance sake, you know, just so that now, whenever I think about these things, you know, well, guy comes, comes at you with a chainsaw, he smells like gasoline. You can barely breathe in this place, but Hey, he's not hurting you. You know, <laughs> I don't know. Right, I feel right. like, um, I feel like I, I earned a lot of nuance from that, but I also don't like it and I don't understand. I think it's one of those things where you think that you want to do it. I mean, people say this about, about those, those extreme haunted houses that you mentioned, like they think they want to do it. They put all this money and all this stuff into it. It's like 
total adrenaline experience. They think they're going to get this like, you know, whatever they think they're going to get, it's not actually what they end up getting. And then afterward they kind of universally regret it. Hmm. Um, because it just isn't a healthy thing to do. Um, I don't know. It's, it's so weird, but I think what people are looking for in that is like some sort of genuine, authentic experience. Like they want to engage with their physiology and they want to, uh, you know, engage with the extreme part of themselves. It's the, it's the fight club thing. You know, it's like, I know, what do you know about yourself? If you haven't been in a fight, you know, that bullshit, it's that kind of thing hmm. where, um, you know, you want to test your own limits and it's like, <laughs> you find out that you're actually pretty squishy and it's not great, you know, and, and it kind of depresses you because you think you're this kind of strong person that can handle just about anything. But it's like, actually, if somebody was really like holding you down and punching you in the face, you probably would buckle, you know, and, and it's just, that's how it is. I don't know. Well, I, I appreciate weird. I appreciate you sharing your experience. I mean, for myself, yeah. I have no I have no interest in going to a place that is so extreme, especially a place that um, that doesn't have safe words. I I have been pretty interested and have recently done some um, clinical training in something called polyvagal theory, and it talks about the uh, the phylogenetic hierarchy of survival response um, in the nervous system. And wow. when you're in a place, it's called ventral. When you're in ventral, you're safe. You're you're able to you know modulate your state, um, attend to your state. You're able to be in healthy social engagement. And if a threat arrives, then you drop into the sympathetic nervous system and then you fight or flight. And if fight or flight doesn't work, you go into this other place, which is called dorsal. And it's freeze dissociation you know, death feigning, and it's a dangerous place and it's very difficult to get out of. With something like, you know, no safe words, there is at some point your sympathetic nervous system is no longer, it knows it's got nothing to do. So the only other option after that is, you know, just keep tearing or just give up, which can be really damaging to the mind. In fact, you know, most of the time when trauma develops, trauma develops because the person was not able to mobilize a sympathetic response to get them out of the situation, to fight or flee. They drop into a, you know, a dorsal place, into this frozen place or dissociated place and, you know, parts. And then trauma is a different thing entirely, not entirely, but a larger discussion about, you know, disorders of the memory and stuff. So the idea of going into a place like that with no safe word is like, um, for me, it would be immediate no zone. But I could see where some people say, like you said, they want to explore the extremes of their physiology um, in a quote unquote safe, but we'll just say structured environment um, right. and have a safe word. And it's like, okay, that person starts hitting you in the face and carrying you away you could you want it to stop obviously and you could stop it right now or you could just go with it for a little while now that said it's a dangerous place because the you know this is this is something i've gotten out of kink is that the person who's the dom they need to be as responsible at, you know for for calling the safe word as the person who's the sub <laughs> because at a certain point you know if you, the person the sub person the sub submissive person can go into an altered state where they no longer know where their boundaries are. They're no longer able to properly attend to the safe word if they go into a really extreme place. And at that point, the aggressor needs to be able, or aggressor, excuse me, excuse me the, the, the dominating person needs to be able to know, hey, actually, okay, we're stopping. We're stopping and we're pulling out. Um, and I wonder about people who are in these extreme haunts, if they have that you know, or if they're just people who are looking for places to exercise and need to be an aggressor in some way or another. Yeah. So I could see where it could be healthy, you know, especially people who are like, I need to go through this again in control because it happened to me when I was out of control. And so they get to have the experience again, say, of being abducted and taken apart, knowing that they're actually in control the whole time with the safe word um, and right. feel better at, at the end of it having accomplished it, right? So I could see that. But again, it, it seems like I could see how it would be so damaging to a person um, and that it's not it's not something light to be uh, to be experimented with. Yeah, I'm not. I, I kind of trailed off a little bit, just but. No, 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 no. I mean, you're. Yeah, I mean, you're very, you're very insightful. Um, 
because like honestly i i feel like there's been a lot of things in my life that i've like i've entered that state and i i mean this is personal but like i mean i've entered that that state of like you know the trauma experience many times and i i mean like i know myself in those environments so it's really weird when you when you do incidentally just end up there which is like like when I went through this place, I was not anticipating going to that place, like going into that physiological dimension. And then you're there and you're like, shit, you know, and you can't, you know, I mean, I I don't, it's not like, that's not your authentic response. Your authentic response is nothing. You just kind of like give up, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's just... But it, it, I don't know. I'm just I'm very interested in why people want this. But then I don't know, just having been there, I also feel like, am I, you know, am I a monster for telling people, no, don't do that. It's very, very bad for you. You know, like, <laughs> uh, you know, what am I what am I to do? But but um, something that I've found in, in making like this documentary and stuff is like, there's a lot of people that work at haunted houses and and this is just my experience with other people that I've worked with and whatever, but that do just do it to kind of, it's kind of like a Dom thing, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, and I want to be an aggressor thing and, and to attack people and to hurt people and also to just kind of be an asshole. Um, <laughs> like there are a lot of people that they just like, they're not s scaring you they're just hurting you with mm. their words and their actions. And, um, you know, it, it's the opposite of that theatrics thing. It's the opposite of that and engaging with this like really cool thing. It's, it's, it is entering into this kind of aggressive scenario where you can be hurt, um, without even really like really realizing it. But, yeah. Yeah. I, I, even then, and then, Part of me for being the yeah, but um, so even even people who are just going in to be assholes, I wonder, you know, if that's actually quite a constructive thing because people are going in asking to be treated like shit by an asshole, right? Right, and that it creates a you know a, a structured, maybe not safe, but a structured container to express those desires in a person, and because it can be expressed in this ritualistic container, you know, it doesn't bleed out into the rest of their lives as much. And I think that's something that comes from, uh, for me, I first came across it uh, with David Data, who's a sex, spiritual sex philosopher. He's There's a lot of issues okay. there. It's very, I mean, he says it's all about energy and blah, 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 but it, it seems very heteronormative, which can be problematic for people who aren't, right? right. Um, yeah. But one of the things he talks about is inside the masculine, right, is a desire to dominate. And whatever, the masculine energy, blah, blah, blah. And the right, things like yeah. horror films and aggressive play, whatever it is, these are places where it could be safely experimented with in a show of theatrics. Um, and I, th I think something similar was said um, by someone who is much more reputable, Carl Jung, about how going to these places and uh, while well, he doesn't, wasn't talking about haunted houses, but frightening things as an opportunity to cathartically process shadow material. And, and for some people, possibly doing inside of that in a ritualistic container enables them to sort some stuff out and prevent things that are already there from bleeding out into the rest of their lives and thus damaging the integrity of their social relationships or their mental health. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's weird. Like, I feel like I have a direct experience with that too, where like, so I, I have this like book that I've been writing and it's, it's like fiction, but a lot of it is really, really dark stuff, like really mean stuff that like some of it actually like really happened to me. But then I feel like after I write some of this stuff down, I suddenly feel fine. You know, I feel like completely fine. Like it's not in there at all. And so like, I can totally see the parallels where where people would need that and then suddenly they feel like it's a release of some kind, you know, it's like they're, they're letting go of this part of, of their life a little bit. And like completing something that was stuck. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. 
So but then yeah. let's say we could maybe postulate horror as a technology. You yeah, know, and it, it can be extremely positive. And yeah. it, and it could be extremely neutral in the sense I was like, yeah. yeah, it was a thing. And it could be really damaging for people yeah. as well. Yeah. So that said, let's finish off. Uh, we're getting to the hour here. Um, right. On just a little personal exploration for you. What is your, I've got three questions here. One, okay. what is your favorite genre, horror genre personally and why? Okay. The second question is, what is your favorite classical franchise and why? Okay. <laughs> and the third one is, what is your favorite modern horror film and why? And I can remind All you right. of the questions as we go on. Okay, Doc. So first one is genre. Favorite genre, favorite genre. Um, I think we already talked about that, actually. Religious genre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Pretty much. And and it's kind of for those... Well, religious and body horror are my two. Um, body because of like dysphoria and like feeling unwelcome in my own body for like the majority of my life. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't have qualms talking about that. So like, that's like a total thing, you know, uh, feeling like my physiology is like, like changing in a way that I don't like, uh, has always been a thing. So when I watch somebody turn into a literal cockroach on a, <laughs> in a movie, you know, it's kind of amazing because it's like, Hey, that's how I feel. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, you know, but usually the, the shitty thing about, about body horror is it almost always ends with the person killing themselves or like ending up in some scenario where they die. Like the fly is like, you know, the guy changes to this point where he just like, what the fuck, you know, <laughs> like he, he's such a, he's like this fly person. He just completely runs out of all other options. It's just surreal, you know? Um, and at some point he just, you know, dies. And then um, Videodrome, you know, guy uh, turns his stomach turns into a television and then his hand turns into a VHS tape and then his other hand turns into a gun. So, you know, what are you going to do? So he shoots himself with his gun hand. You know, uh, there's there's one good example of this, though, which is like uh, Tetsuo the Iron Man. I don't know if you've heard of this no. uh, or seen this. No. Well, OK, so it's this it's this wild black and white Japanese movie where um, a man runs over a guy with his car and it turns out the guy that he ran over was a, was a metal fetishist. Like he was really super into sticking metal into his body. So, uh, the, the guy he runs over with his car possesses and haunts him. And then he starts to feel metal in his body and it starts to like come out. And then like, you know, his arms start to turn into these metal parts and then his like back starts to turn into these metal parts. He starts to like grow metal hairs out of his chest and then like his dick turns into a giant screwdriver and like all this stuff. And then he starts to turn into this like robot person and he just completely loses control. Like he's just metal is just spewing forth from his body and he's like trying to have a relationship with his girlfriend, but she's like half into it half not into it you know it, it just they just act like it's kind of normal a little bit mm -hmm. like um like there's like a sex scene with the screwdriver penis and it's like very interesting um but anyway uh and then at the end of the movie like the spirit of the the iron man that he ran over comes out and they actually have a conversation and like, so he's having a conversation with this demon that's completely fucked up his entire body or whatever. And they decide that they're like soulmates and that's why this all happened. And then they're like, let's go fucking take over the world. <laughs> it's like the best ending to one of, to a body horror movie because it's like, they don't kill themselves. Like, it's just finally, you know, it doesn't end in some sort of tragic death because at the end they're like, yeah, we're all fucked up. Let's go fuck up the world. You know, it's really, um, apocalypticism, but it's like pretty, <laughs> it's pretty rad. Well, okay. Um, so it's a little late, but spoiler, spoiler alert guys. <laughs> <laughs> it came out in the 90, 80s. Uh, anyway, sorry, go ahead. Anyways. So let's move on to the second question. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. What is your favorite? Uh, actually, I just want to. I, I just want to say that I. I have never really been in. Like, I actually, I am into body horror. Um, because I yeah. like th gross things. I think this is really like a stereotypical boy thing to be like into. Like, actually, it's not just stereotypical. It's like, you know, observed 
be it culturally conditioned or not, in young boys right. to be have a greater tolerance to things like snot and blood and slime and this kind of stuff compared right. to yeah. you know younger females. But um, I've always been interested in that, but I I never really you know I, I don't I have some I wouldn't say it's body dysmorphia. Uh, but I definitely have body image issues like most people brought up in Western society where the expectation of what looks good is an unrealistic expectation unless you're unhealthy about how you focus on your health. Uh, right. yeah. So I really appreciate you sharing that piece because it sort of brings a lot of light to that to that genre in a way that I, I wasn't able to relate to it before. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah. So the next question is, the what is your favorite horror franchise uh, it could be modern but it could be classic i already told you for me it's nightmare on elm street because i just love you know weird dream stuff and reality shift i mean i'm a guy who's into psychedelic so this kind of thing is like very curious for me what about yeah. for you well okay so th that one's difficult because like well there's the core ones which is like okay halloween is probably my favorite horror movie which is just the you know the straight up OG slasher, you mm -hmm. know, but I actually kind of feel like, no, it's not actually my favorite movie, you know, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre probably is. And maybe that comes from the regionalistic aspects, like because I live around here. I'm just into that. But I think that is kind of unironically my favorite franchise. But also like Nightmare on Elm Street is is amazing. Like the dream stuff is all yeah. of it. It's just it's it's so creative. Every single movie. Um and then, you know, Friday the 13th is dumb trash and I just love it. But, um, but I guess I think the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise is the weirdest and best one in, in my eyes because it's so unpredictably weird. Like the first movie, very simple, just, you know, there's a hillbilly family that is also a cannibal family and it play, you know, it talks about our insecurities of like, you know, the silent voter. You know, it's that kind of thing mm -hmm. where especially during the Vietnam era, it's like who is actually in favor of this shit? And like and, you know, who who are these people that are like plaguing us politically? And it's like, oh, it's these people. You know, it's like it's almost like a joke, the movie. Um, But but then like the the whole scenario is just where like hippie youth end up there and then they just die because like the motivations are just, um, you know, authoritarian and vicious it's just you know toby hooper filmed uh uh he he was making a documentary about people like crime in some city it might have been dallas and uh he was like in a hospital ward with a camera like an eight millimeter camera and he was just filming people coming in and then a guy came in with a gunshot and he like literally filmed this guy dying and he, this had never happened to him before, but he's got this eight millimeter camera and he's just watching and rolling as this guy's like, you know, completely just all the stages just completely loses. It's like he, it's like you can watch his like soul leave his body. It's really fucked up stuff. And he filmed it. And afterward, he didn't know that he was capable of doing that. And it really like drastically changed him. Hmm. So then when he moved into making, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, he was like, okay, I want to make a movie that does what doing that did to me, to an audience and Whoa. motivate it politically. So like, that's the whole thing with that. But then like the fun thing about the franchise is when we move into the second one, which is just a farce, it's just a comedy making fun of the first movie, mm -hmm. which is like, so he has these very serious intentions for this first movie, but he does feel like there's this entire joke and all the stuff in that first movie that completely goes unnoticed because it's so horrific so in the second movie he's like fine i'll just make a straight up comedy so he just makes a straight up comedy out of it doing the exact same movie almost but just as all all of it's a joke and it's hilarious uh it's amazing uh, and then like so he drops off the franchise and then there's the third one which is more just like a straight up action movie uh and I don't care for the third one so much. Um, there's not really anything interesting to say. But the fourth one is Buck Wild. Uh, it's Matthew McConaughey, Renee Zellweger. It's shot locally, like like right around me. And uh, it was back when both of them were nobodies, you know. 
and there's like a guy with a robot leg and there's like a like mad scientist these stuff and like half of the movie is just them dicking around and eating pizza and you're like what is what even is going on and uh then there's an illuminati that shows up and is like hey you're not making the horror movie that everybody wants and they're like damn it so it's like this meta <laughs> thing that enters into the movie about halfway through and they're like the literal illuminati has come and is telling them to make the horror movie that people want to see. So then they start trying to be the horror movie that people want to see, where it's like screaming and violence and stabbings and, you know, all the stuff. But then that just doesn't work out because it's just too weird and lame. So then, like, the final sequence is them, like, running outside, which mirrors the first movie. And then a plane comes down from the sky, and the plane has the word Illuminati written on it. And it runs over Matthew McConaughey from the sky and like it <laughs> crashes into him. And then like the the like final girl or whatever ends up in a car. It's Renee Zellweger. She ends up in a car with the Illuminati guy and he's taking her to the hospital. And he's like, I'm sorry for this. This was supposed to be scary and this whole experience. But we didn't do it. Yeah. I don't know. Well, spoiler and, alert, everyone. <laughs> and then it just rolls credits. And you're just like. What? <laughs> so I don't know. As far as like a, a franchise that is complicated in how weird and not nonsensical it is, and with like all these like differing wild emotions, uh, that series is something else. Uh, it's kind of hard to match. And I don't think people talk about it because it's just kind of like, you know, you get that first movie and you're like, good to go. Uh, but all these other movies, the stuff they do with these this like whole scenario is just wild. Um, but yeah, I don't know. So there's that one. <laughs> Great. So the final, the final question um, is what is your favorite modern horror film right now? And uh, I'm thinking in the last five years, unless you want to push it because it's necessary. Um, and why? Well, there's a few. <clears throat> but you got to pick one. I yeah, well, okay, so I'm going to pick The Witch, I think, um, which is, I mean, okay, The Witch is like a religious horror uh, kind of contained glass bottle movie where it's a bunch of, like, it's a it's a group of settlers and they are in the woods and there's a witch in the woods and the witch plagues their crops and so wait the, just make sure you don't spoil this one because it's modern enough yeah, that people yeah, might yeah, want to yeah, check yeah. it out yeah. okay can do um but yes but in the first five minutes it's established that there's a witch in the woods the witch steals their child and and smashes it with a with a big stick and then rubs its like guts on the witch's body and then use and like puts it on a broomstick and then just flies out into the night. And it's like this whole amazing wild sequence. And that's the first five minutes. So they come right out of the gate with that. But, but the funny thing is like, it's a family drama slash religious horror. So they, they, they use the religious horror stuff to get us in there and then they make us paranoid. But then it turns out the family is actually like a total disaster and everybody in there is like everybody in there has these very complicated, terrible uh, sort of deep seated issues and they're all motivated religiously. So they're like justifying their own problems with their religiosity or whatever. Is that a word? Um, and uh and so it turns into this kind of like confrontation, family confrontation movie, but it's set in the stage of like the devil is is living with them kind of hmm. in a weird way. And like there's all this weird absurdist stuff and abstract stuff that that falls in there. And as this family kind of falls apart, there's just a lot of like like micro religious statements that are really uh incredible but like i connect with the movie a lot because you know growing up in in kind of a religious area which I'm, you can connect to it it's it plagues on that feeling where you're trapped with this family of people and you know all their deep-seated issues because you know them right. and you just watch them constantly justify it with their 
religion. You know, they constantly justify their own insecurities and all of these problems uh, with their religion. And the thing you want more than anything else is to get away from it. Um, but unfortunately, like getting away from it means that you're basically dealing with the devil in their eyes, which mm. is like this whole horrible thing. So I just really connect to that with that movie on that level. Like, I think that I think there's not enough discussion about that movie. Um, it just kind of fizzled a bit um, with a lot of people. But yeah, that movie sticks with me. Uh, I've seen that movie a lot of times and I've thought about it a lot and should probably make a video or write something about this movie one day, but I just haven't done it. Um, well, that one's, that one's hard. actually on my list. Uh, I got a list. See, although I've gotten to a point now where I no longer watch horror by myself, which I think is a healthy thing for me. Um, so mm. I'm just waiting to organize some people. Maybe now I'm just like trying to optimize the cuddle factor or something. Uh, uh, I totally feel you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I think it's now's a good, now's a good time to draw it close. Um, although before I do, I'm going to ask you, and I don't want to spoil this because this might be for other listeners, maybe for yourself. If you ever saw the film death of a ghost hunter. So it's, it's really B level and it's about a group of people who go into a house that's supposedly haunted, trying to figure out if it's actually haunted, get it on film and, and all this stuff. And there's some, well, I don't want to say it. We'll just say there's some religious connotations in there. Have you seen this film? I think I maybe tried to rent this at Blockbuster. I might back when Blockbuster was a thing. Like, I think I'm, I might have seen it then because I used to watch everything that was at Blockbuster. But I don't remember it other than the name. So I'm going to probably say I haven't seen it. Okay, so given that we've both just expressed a you know a shared interest in films that have religious tone uh i'm just going to i'm just going to throw out there my personal recommendation to check that film with the caveat okay. that i'm sure you will be able to appreciate which is it's low budget um oh yeah and so visually acting wise is low budget but also the sound quality is terrible i don't know how they managed to make it so that you can't hear most of what the hell is happening in that film most of the time or if it was intentional for all i know but i'm just throwing out there that suggestion of death of a ghost hunter um one of one of my personal favorites and also oh, yeah. May, thank you for getting on the show with me. And, uh, you know, you're one of a small, very small handful of people who have a, a deep knowledge and a deep investment in the horror genre. Um, and this was very, you know, quick to organize and to quick to put together. So thank you for your receptivity. And thanks for sharing with uh, Adventures of the Mind. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. All right, for the listeners, thank you for tuning in to this episode of Adventures Through the Mind. Uh, you normally we release every two weeks a special Halloween episode because I'm very interested in horror, love Halloween. Uh, big thanks to my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so by doing so um, on Patreon or by going to jameswjesso.com forward slash support for uh, leaving a, I feel self-conscious cause I know you're still on the line as I'm doing this. <laughs> I normally, totally okay. I normally do this in post-production and do like seven or eight takes. Um, yes. Thank you for leaving a donation through PayPal or, or Bitcoin or whatever. James and Jessica.com forward slash support. Thanks for tuning in May. Thanks again. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right. And cut.